Hello! Welcome back to More Fun Making It, the channel you can set your clock by if your clock happens to be an indoor sundial. But never mind all that. The sun has peeked through the curtains and the sundial says it's time for another retro computer repair. A good Twitter friend, at SmileyBobUK, right. knew I was after an Acorn Electron and kindly pointed me to this Facebook Marketplace ad. £45 for a working Electron is a decent price. For an untested one, it's a bit of a risk. On first inspection, I was reasonably happy with the overall condition. That yellow spacebar might need its teeth whitening, but oh, that's not cool. the other keys in the case are a nice colour. Half the power socket has broken away. I'll need to inspect that inside. I've never worked on one of these. In fact, this is the first time I've owned or even held an elk in my life. I might have typed something rude into one in WH Smith's back in the day before crunching a stink bomb under my foot and legging it like the horrible child I used to be. The hard fact was, in my social group, the Electron didn't feature at all, which is a shame. It's a lovely machine. This hole is where an RF modulator socket should be. The other connections are composite, which is black and white, RGB and cassette. Ah, a zit. Although it didn't come with the screws included, a previous owner has managed to insert one of the long ones where a long screw doesn't belong. Never mind, adds character. Like a beauty spot. The keyboard cable has some creases, but no obvious tears or breaks. The connector has some wear and tear, but looks to also be in reasonable condition. My first look inside an elk. It's a nice, neatly laid out board. Lots of room inside, and it's really clean. It has half a power supply on the right, which accepts an external 19 volt transformer type brick. It then passes that 19 volt AC straight to the edge connector for powering certain peripherals, as well as transforming it to plus five and minus five volts for the motherboard here. I can't see any obvious gotcha problems on this board, so it's time to plug it in and see if I manage to bag a deal. Or is it broken? I've already tested the power supply output to the motherboard off camera and it has good voltage. I've been warned that an electron won't work without a keyboard connected, so on that goes. Oh, okay, it's a broken electron. Even better, now I have something to fix. And it's a machine I know nothing about. Yay! Now then, coming from a background of mostly fixing ZX Spectrums with their RAM made of candy floss, I looked at this picture, rubbed my chin, and sagely announced, That looks like a RAM fault. Don't ask where that accent came from. Twitter, the font of most of my knowledge, declared it was most likely a ULA problem and I should reseat the ULA chip in its socket. Unfortunately, the ULA on this issue 4 board is a later revision from when they decided the sockets were either too complicated, unreliable or expensive and just soldered the whole thing to the motherboard. Searching through some Stardot forums, the place to go if you need to know anything about Acorn computers, suggested either the ULA or the CPU could be at fault. Time to give this a closer inspection and see if anything jumps out as suspicious. The ULA being the number one suspect is the one part of this computer I can't easily replace. There's no current working modern replacement, although there are efforts going on to that end. On the other side, the solder looks pretty bad. There's a lot of flux hiding the worst of it, but many of these joints are starved of solder. I whipped the soldering iron out and removed some of the old solder with braid and replaced it with shiny new 6040 Loctite Special Brew. Going over the rest of the board, there's an area here where the tracks are exposed, but none of them are broken. You can also tell from this angle which areas of the board have been worked on before and which haven't. All of the memory, the logic chips over here, are original. The ULA, CPU and ROM have all had work done. Either reflowed in a repair effort or they were replaced previously. Going back to the top side, all the passives all look in good condition. It does have one odd capacitor with our favourite brand of electrolytics. Reflowing the ULA didn't fix the fault, 
So I whipped out my new oscilloscope. Thank you, Santa. Sorry about making the naughty list in 87. Hope you've liked and subscribed. Whipped out the scope, printed out a schematic and began prodding stuff. I started with the RAM for no better reason than it was closest to me. And this is what I found. All the address lines appeared correct. Pin 2 and 14 are the data lines 1 and 0. On the first three RAM chips, these were showing a square wave of some description. It didn't look right, but a logic level signal was there. On the fourth chip, those data lines were showing this. My instincts weren't letting me down. I've often mentioned Gadget UK on here, and for good reason. I'm very new to all this electronics repair malarkey, and it's thanks to channels like Gadget UK and a few others that I've been able to go from almost scratch to being able to diagnose and fix machines like this for fun. One of the tricks I learned from Mr Gadget, or is it Mr UK, is the piggyback trick with RAM. I'd never had the opportunity to try this myself. I popped out a 4532 from a nearby specky and shoved it on top of the suspect chip and held my breath. And it only went and worked. Kinda. No keyboard attached, let's try that again. It works! Took me a little while to get used to the idiosyncrasies of the Electron keyboard, but in the end I entered the Master Program. I can't leave that chip perched on top of the broken one, so it's time to install a socket and see if there are any more surprises awaiting me. One of the best tools I've purchased recently is my desoldering station. It is simply brilliant. Once you get the hang of how best to use it. Not working on a flat surface is the first thing I've found. If the gun is pointing straight down, the old solder falls back into the tube inside and blocks it. Adding some good quality, juicy, fresh solder to each joint is the next thing I learned. Getting good thermal contact is the key, and crunchy, corroded solder isn't good at conducting heat. If needed, straighten the pins with the iron too, especially if they are bent right over as they are on this board. I have the temperature set to 330 degrees for most things. Giving the solder enough time to flow right through to the other side is important. A little wiggle and continue to press the trigger as I take the nozzle away. I rarely get blockage now and as you'll see it does a great job. Once I've been over it I give each pin a tweak to see which need more attention. Sometimes this means reflowing a joint, as here with these two, and sometimes it means going back to the other side and using some braid to get the last bit of solder off. This pin here in the bottom left corner is on that big thick trace and has a big blob that won't be sucked through. Some braid sorts that out. You still need to be careful. The ends of the pins have been cut and bent over and they can cause damage as they're removed. Especially if they look like these. Worth taking the time to give it a final clean with some braid and then some IPA on both sides. I said in the previous video I wasn't completely convinced with the need of sockets. I would like to state here and now for the record that I've very much changed my mind since then. Sockets are great. Light pressure on the top and reflow the pins to make sure it's flush to the board. Job done. But what about that RAM chip? Is it really faulty? Yep, totally dead. Here's a new one for comparison. 
The old one gets the dreaded silver sharpie mark. Testing time. Programming genius. OX code, OX code. Eat your heart out. Whilst typing in that complicated program, I realised there was something wrong with the spacebar. It's only connected in the centre. It seems there are two components missing from here that connect the spacebar to that metal arm on each side. The lovely electron programming genius Electron Greg off of Twitter offered to send me some replacements, which was very kind and I'm really grateful for the offer. But this looked like a job for a 3D printer, and if I can make something myself, I'll always try to go that way. Sadly, there wasn't a thing available on the thingiverse already made for me, but I did find one for the BBC Micro Keyboard. Surely that would be the same thing. Well, no. Those ones are way too long. But in every other way, they were just right. I just needed to make them shorter. I logged into the wonderful Tinkercad, imported the BBC version and chopped a few millimetres out of the middle. It didn't take long to print another set. Fitting these with them already inserted in the spacebar is very tricky. I managed it once and then realised I didn't have the camera recording. So I took them out and for your entertainment tried to put them back in. It wasn't having any of it. There's almost enough flex and room to do it but it's really tight. Must have got lucky the first time. The much easier way to do this is to put the new tabs into position first and then drop the spacebar onto them and press down. So much easier. Fixed. Feels great. I'll share the file on Thingiverse with a link in the description. With that done, I was keen to test the memory. Normally, I'd use a diagnostic car on a Speccy or a C64, but I don't have one of those for the Elk. Another option is running a game and seeing if it crashes. Crude, but effective. But this time, I didn't have any way to load a game, as I was waiting for cables to arrive. I was encouraged to type in this frankly enormous RAM test program, which worked, sort of. It worked in so much as the computer crashed as I was typing it in. I turned it off and on and crossed my fingers. It seemed to go well for a while. I was happy to turn the camera off and concentrate on typing in the program. And then it crashed again. This time I didn't think it was memory. It was intermittent and probably happened due to a combination of me physically bashing the keys and the computer heating up inside. This smelled a lot like a dry solder joint. I went back to the other side of the board and searched for likely suspects, but nothing looked crusty back there. By chance I took a look at the solder pins on the top side of the ULA. This is a PCB with pins mounted into it, which have small pads on top. And as you can see under the blurry scope, almost all of these solder joints have cracked. I recently took delivery of a new pine seal soldering iron one recommended by the likes of Adrian's Digital Basement and many others on Twitter. It came with this pointed tip which I thought would be good for these tiny pads. I was wrong. I used to use a conical tip like this all the time. Once I changed over to a chisel tip, I never looked back. Well, not till today. After making a bit of a mess with the conical tip, I swapped back to my usual tip and tried again. It's so much easier to use. If you need a lot of surface area, you can turn it flat side down. And if you need a fine point for smaller work, you flip it over. It's easy to dab the solder into the face of the tip and let it flow into the joint. I'm adding flux to the joints to aid the flow. These tiny pads are quite tricky. I'm trying to get a good dome on each one to give it some strength.
It would be nice to think I went straight to the ULA as the cause of the problem, but before I got there, I removed and tested the rest of the memory, which was all fine. So a few more sockets need to be fitted and then I can test it. Out of curiosity, I started it without a keyboard again, and this time, instead of repeating random characters and the number 4, it just gave this solitary 3. Keyboard connected, a large listing of memory test program for me to type in. And no crashing, despite leaving it switched on for hours. I'm feeling quite confident. I was informed partway through the typing that this program was most likely written for the BBC Micro. There was a chance it would work on the Electron, but possibly not. But I decided to wait for a cable to be delivered and test it with some games instead. Whilst waiting I got to work replacing the power socket. It happens to be a nice standard one, exactly the same as the one in the 48k Spectrum which I had in stock. That'll only take a minute, I foolishly thought to myself. Then I spotted a crack in the board. Underneath you can see this has been repaired after a fashion. To be fair, I've seen worse. The first thing to do is remove as much of that solder as possible and get the old socket out and then see what we're dealing with. Once that's out, I could see there was a fairly large crack in the board but it only extended as far as the socket itself. The two pins at the top and the bottom are the important ones. The one to the side is connected to the top pin of the socket internally. It would be nice to flow enough solder to connect it on this side of the board too, for added strength. The pad from the third pin ended up on my workbench. Putting it back on will give something for the solder to flow onto. It seems fairly solid now, but I don't want to take any chances. Hot glue is often seen as a messy solution, but used in the right way it can work really well. It's just about impossible to apply it neatly right out of the gun. So the way I've learned, thank you again Gadget UK, to do this is to dump some glue in roughly the right place and then blast it with some hot air to flow it into a nicer shape. It's now really solid, I have no worries about this breaking under normal use. Is that it? Well, mostly, as I said before this arrived, with no screws at all. I've ordered a set from the Bay of Ease, but I don't think you need to see me putting those in. For now, I've found one suitable screw for the power supply board to stop it from moving about when the plug is inserted, and a couple of screws that fit the expansion port threaded inserts. Happily, they also hold the case together quite nicely, so I'll leave those in place. One more thing. As well as no screws and no modulator, it was also missing a speaker. I ordered a new one and here it is. The last thing to do is plug in my Retro Computer Shack cables and test some games. Seriously, get these if you need cables for your retro computers. They are excellent value and amazing quality. Ian Pretty does an incredible job making and distributing these. Link in the description to his eBay shop. I am not affiliated. The Elk has some incredible love from the retro scene. People like Oxcode, Oxcode? Oh. and Snugsy87 are still actively developing new games for it. One of my favourites is Elementum by Oxcode. I've played this clever platformer on an emulator and I couldn't wait to finally be able to play it on real hardware. It's an incredibly addictive game. Imagine how well this would have sold or been pirated back in the 80s. I hope you enjoyed watching me find my way around this cute little 8-bit machine. It was a lot of fun to work on. You really should go and check out Gadget UK who has or is just about to feature a double electron repair on his superb channel. As for me, coming up on the channel soon, Tim, I have a spectrum repair the likes of which you've never seen before.
Oh my word. If you want to follow along with my repairs, I post just about everything I do to my nah. Twitter feed. Come along and join in the fun. I will see you next time. Bye.